Anders Bering Breivik was born in Oslo on February 13, 1979. His father, Jens Breivik, had three children from a former marriage, Eric, Jan, and Nina. His mother, Venka Bering, had a daughter from a past relationship named Elizabeth. As a child, Anders frequently attracted the attention of psychologists who were worried about the state of his mental health. His mother, too, was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. According to a psychologist's report, it was observed that the boy displayed an unusual smile, which was believed to be a calculated response to his surroundings, rather than an authentic expression of his emotions. Another report from Norway's National Center for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry expressed concerns about the treatment the boy received from his mother. It was mentioned that she subjected him to sexualization, physical abuse, and frequently expressed her wish for his death. Anders's mother had fled from an abusive home when she was just 17 years old and became a teenage mother shortly after. In her 30s, she married Anders's father, and during her pregnancy, she relocated to London where he was working. Even before Anders's birth, his mother developed a strong dislike for him, considering him a nasty child who purposely kicked her. She had initially intended to have an abortion, but by the time she sought medical assistance, the pregnancy had progressed beyond the three-month limit. Subsequent psychological reports described her perception of Breivik as a fundamentally wicked and malevolent child, determined to ruin her. She ceased breastfeeding him early on, claiming that he was sucking the life out of her. His parents would end up divorcing when he was one year old. Anders moved back to Skoyen, Oslo, where he settled with his mother and Elizabeth. They initially borrowed Jens Breivik's apartment in the Frogner district. According to neighbors, there were reports of frequent fights and instances where Breivik's mother would leave her children unattended for long periods of time while she worked as a nurse. In 1981, Breivik's mother applied for welfare benefits, seeking financial assistance. In 1982, she also applied for respite care for her son, explaining that she felt overwhelmed and unable to properly care for him. She described him as clingy and demanding. As a result, in collaboration with the Child Welfare Service, Breivik was placed with a young couple. This couple informed the police that when Breivik's mother brought him to their home at the age of two, she requested that he be allowed to touch the man's genitals because he had never seen male genitalia and wanted to make a comparison, as he had only seen female genitalia before, according to the couple's statement to the police, which was undated. In February 1983, Prompted by the advice of neighbors, Breivik's mother sought assistance from the National Center for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Both she and Breivik received outpatient care, spending approximately one month at the center during daytime hours. The psychiatrists at the center concluded that Breivik should be placed in foster care and separated from his mother in order for him to have a chance at normal development. Breivik displayed minimal emotional engagement, lacked joy, and did not cry when hurt. He showed no interest in playing with other children and exhibited extreme cleanliness, becoming anxious when his toys were not in order. Psychologists believed that his mother's negative reactions to his emotions had led him to suppress any visible signs of emotion as she punished him and reacted negatively to his displays of feelings. His mother also accused him of being unclean and claimed she constantly had to care for him and chase after him. Psychologists theorized that Breivik had become excessively clean out of fear of punishment from his mother, as he did not exhibit the typical level of four-year-old messiness. Reports from the center staff indicated that Breivik's mother told him she wished he were dead, deliberately doing so while being observed by healthcare personnel. Simultaneously, she alternated between strong affection and extreme cruelty towards him. The final conclusion of the observation emphasized the urgent need for help stating that Anders should be removed from the family to receive better care. However, Child Welfare Services did not follow this recommendation and only placed Breivik in respite care on weekends, hoping for eventual foster care placement. When Breivik's father learned about the situation, he sought custody. Although Breivik's mother initially agreed to have him placed in respite care, she later demanded full custody when Jens filed for custody. Legal battles ensued between the parents, and ultimately the case was dropped due to the welfare services belief that they lacked sufficient evidence to justify foster care placement. The testimony from staff at the Vigilant Sparkin Nursery, which Breivik had attended since 1981, played a significant role in this decision. 
They described him as a happy child with no apparent issues. Throughout this process, the SSBU maintained their stance that urgent action was necessary to prevent severe developmental problems in the boy. They wrote a letter to the Child Welfare Services, advocating for forcibly removing Breivik. In 1984, a hearing took place in front of the Municipal Child Welfare Committee to determine if Breivik's mother should lose custody. The Child Welfare Service lost the case, represented by a social worker lacking experience in presenting cases before the committee. It was decided that the family should be supervised, but after only three visits, the supervision was discontinued. Breivik was never placed in respite care or foster care again. During his teenage years, Breivik displayed a rebellious nature. He became deeply involved in graffiti art and actively participated in the hip-hop community in Oslo West. Unlike his peers, he took his graffiti pursuits very seriously, which led to multiple encounters with the police. As a result, child welfare services were once again involved, and Breivik received fines on two occasions. According to his mother, his father cut off contact with him when he was 15 years old, after he was caught and fined, for vandalizing walls with graffiti in 1995. They reportedly had no communication since then. However, Breivik's father contradicted this claim, stating that it was actually his son who severed contact, despite his willingness to maintain a relationship, despite the destructive activities Breivik engaged in. In 2002, at the age of 23, Breivik claimed to have initiated a nine-year plan to fund the attacks that took place in 2011. He started his own computer programming business while working at a customer service company. According to him, the company grew to employ six individuals, and he had several offshore bank accounts. Breivik asserted that he earned his first million kroner at the age of 24. However, he mentioned losing two million kroner through stock speculation, but still had approximately two million kroner remaining to finance the attacks. Eventually, the company went bankrupt, and Breivik faced multiple legal violations, prompting him to move back to his mother's home to save money. The initial psychiatric evaluation conducted on him stated that his mental health deteriorated during this period, leading to withdrawal and isolation. According to Norwegian tax authorities, his declared assets in 2007 were around 630,000 kroner. Breivik claimed that by 2008, he possessed about 2 million kroner and had access to 26,000 kroner in credit through nine credit cards. In May 2009, he established a farming company called Breivik Geofarm, focused on cultivating vegetables, melons, roots, and tubers. However, in 2010, during a visit to Prague, he attempted to acquire illegal weapons but was unsuccessful. Instead, he decided to obtain firearms through legal channels in Norway. Breivik legally purchased a semi-automatic 9mm Glock 34 pistol by demonstrating his membership in a pistol club during the gun license application process. He also obtained a semi-automatic Ruger Mini 14 rifle by possessing a hunting license. In his manifesto, Breivik mentioned playing video games like World of Warcraft for relaxation and using Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 2, as a training simulation. During a court hearing in April 2012, he claimed that he used a holographic weapon site while playing Call of Duty to train his target acquisition skills. As stated in his manifesto, Breivik claimed that he utilized his company as a front to legally acquire significant quantities of artificial fertilizers and other chemicals for the production of explosives. In May, his company purchased six tons of fertilizer from a farming supplier. The newspaper Verdens Gang reported that Breivik's name was included among 60 individuals provided to the Police Security Service, PST, by the Norwegian Customs Service. This was due to his purchase of a small amount of explosive primer from an online shop in Poland. John Fitcher from the PST mentioned that the information they gathered did not raise any suspicions or indicate any suspicious activities. On July 11, 2011 at 3.25 p.m., Anders detonated a bomb in central Oslo, outside the tower block housing the office of Prime Minister Jens Stoltenberg, resulting in eight deaths. The bomb was concealed in a white Volkswagen crafter. The van was parked at 3.16 p.m., and after 16 seconds, the front door of the van opened. Another 16 seconds later, the driver emerged from the van. Dressed in a police officer's attire, the driver carried a gun and wore a police helmet with a face shield obscuring his face. 
After spending seven seconds outside the van, the driver swiftly walked away towards Hammersburg Torg, where he had another vehicle parked. A police helmet with a face shield was covering his face. Breivik was not positively identified. The shockwave shattered windows on all floors, as well in other structures across the square. The streets in the vicinity were strewn with debris and broken glass. A cloud of white smoke, believed to be from a continuing fire at the Department of Oil and Energy, billowed in the air. The powerful explosion could be heard from a distance of at least four and a half miles. Following the detonation, the vicinity of the affected buildings was secured with cordons, and individuals in the area were instructed to evacuate. The public was urged to stay calm, and if feasible, to exit the city center. However, there was no widespread evacuation of the entire area. The police received the initial report of the explosion at 3.26 p.m., and by 3.28 p.m., the first police patrol had arrived at the scene. Concurrently, the news agency NTB was informed that the Prime Minister was safe and unharmed. At 3.34, a witness contacted the police to report an individual dressed in a police uniform, holding a pistol, and entering an unmarked Fiat Doblo vehicle. The witness provided detailed information, including the license plate number and a description of the suspect, which was written on a yellow note and delivered to the Police Operations Central. However, it took about 20 minutes before the police contacted the witness again. The license plate number was not transmitted over the police radio until two hours later. Approximately 90 minutes following the Oslo explosion, Breivik, disguised as a police officer under the alias Martin Nilsson, boarded the MS Thorbjorn ferry at Utoikaya in Tirafjorden, a lake located about 32 kilometers northwest of Oslo. His destination was Utoya, where the Norwegian Labor Party's youth camp was being held. The camp, attended by around 600 teenagers, takes place on the island every summer. Upon reaching the island, Breivik posed as a police officer conducting a routine check in response to the Oslo bombing. Monica Bosai, the camp leader and hostess, greeted him, but likely grew suspicious and contacted Tron Bernson, the island's security officer, before Breivik fatally shot them both. He then signaled people to gather around him before revealing weapons and ammunition from a bag and indiscriminately opening fire, causing multiple casualties and injuries. Initially targeting individuals on the island, he later started shooting at those attempting to escape by swimming across the lake. Survivors described a scene of terror, with some wounded victims pretending to be dead, but being shot again when Breivik came back. He spared an 11-year-old boy who had lost his father during the shooting, and a 22-year-old man who pleaded for his life. Witnesses sought refuge in various hiding places, such as undergrowth and lavatories, maintaining communication through text messages to avoid revealing their locations. The mass shooting lasted approximately 90 minutes, concluding when a police special task force arrived and Breivik surrendered, despite having remaining ammunition, at 6.35 p.m. The shooter utilized hollow point or frangible bullets, which inflict greater tissue damage. Throughout the incident, Breivik repeatedly shouted, You are going to die today, Marxists. Monica Bosai's husband and one of her daughters, who were also present, survived the attack. The youngest victim, 14-year-old Sharadin Svebak Bone from Drammen, and 16-year-old Andrin Bakeni Espelan from Sarpsborg, were among those killed. The residents in a flotilla of motorboats and fishing dinghies rushed to rescue survivors, pulling them out of the water and retrieving them from hiding spots along the island's shoreline. Some survived by pretending to be dead. Several campers familiar with the island swam to the secluded west side and sought refuge in caves accessible only by water. Within Skolestua, the schoolhouse, 47 campers and personnel from the Norwegian People's Aid found shelter. Although Breivik fired shots at the locked door, he failed to breach it, and those inside the building survived. Former Prime Minister Gro Harlem Brundtland, whom Breivik professed to hate, and mockingly referred to as Lance Mortarin, murderer of the nation, in his writings, had visited the island earlier that day to deliver a speech to the camp. Breivik stated that his initial intention was to target her specifically, but due to delays related to the renovation of Oslo Central Railway Station, he arrived after she had already departed. The first gunshot was fired at 5.22 p.m. Emergency medical services were notified about the shooting two minutes later, and one minute after that, the police in Oslo were informed. 
The Oslo police immediately made efforts to reach Utoya as quickly as possible, but lacked a helicopter that could provide direct access to the island. By 1730, the Delta Police Tactical Unit from Oslo was en route to Utoya by car. Among the first individuals to arrive at the scene was Marcel Gleff, a German resident staying at Utvika camping on the mainland. Recognizing the sound of gunshots, he piloted his boat to the island and started throwing life jackets to young people in the water, rescuing as many as he could in multiple trips. However, the police eventually asked him to stop. It was estimated that he saved up to 30 lives. Hega Dahlen and Toril Hansen, a married couple vacationing in the area, also played a crucial role in saving lives. Dahlen assisted from the land, while Hansen and a neighboring camper made several trips to rescue people in the water. Additionally, Kasper Elog, a local resident who received a phone call about the distressing situation on Utoya, made three trips to the island and rescued several dozen individuals. Overall, around 150 people who swam away from the island were rescued by campers on the opposite shore. Delta police arrived at the designated meeting point at 6.09 p.m., but had to wait briefly for a boat to transport them across. They reached Utoya at 6.25 p.m. When confronted by the heavily armed police on the island, the gunman initially hesitated for a few seconds. Upon an officer's command to surrender or be shot, he eventually laid down his weapons. Breivik made at least two calls to the emergency phone number 112 to surrender at 6.01 p.m. and 6.26 p.m. while continuing to kill people in between. He hung up on both occasions, and although the police attempted to call him back, they were unsuccessful. When the police arrived at the scene, survivors pleaded with the officers to discard their weapons, fearing that the individuals in uniforms might open fire on them again. During the attack, 69 people lost their lives, and out of the 517 survivors, 66 were wounded. Upon reaching Utoya, the police apprehended not only Breivik, but also Anzor Jukayev, an innocent 17-year-old survivor, representing the Akershus branch of the Workers' Youth League. Disturbingly, reports indicate that Jukayev was undressed and placed in a jail cell, located mere meters away from the cell, housing the self-proclaimed killer. This young victim, who had witnessed mass murders in Chechnya during his childhood, was suspected of being an accomplice due to discrepancies in his appearance compared to his identity document, as well as his seemingly different emotional reaction to the horrifying events compared to most other survivors. He was held in custody for a period of 17 hours. Lawyer Harold Stable criticized the police for neglecting to contact Jukayev's family, who were concerned for his safety and believed he might have been killed. Stebel also criticized the police for interrogating the victim without the presence of a lawyer. The attacks were the deadliest in Norway since World War II, and a survey revealed that one out of every four Norwegians had a connection to someone impacted by the attacks. The Oslo explosion injured 209 of the 325 people estimated to have been in the government buildings. Out of the 69 individuals who lost their lives in the island attack, 57 of them suffered fatal gunshot wounds to the head. In total, 67 people were killed by gunshots, one died after falling from a cliff while attempting to escape, and one drowned trying to swim away from the island. Throughout the course of the attack, Breivik discharged a minimum of 186 shots and still possessed a significant amount of ammunition when he was apprehended. Around 110 individuals sustained a range of physical injuries. Approximately 50 people sought medical treatment at a makeshift clinic established nearby, where they received care for relatively minor injuries like cuts, bruises, and hypothermia. These injuries were a result of their escape from the island, which involved fleeing and swimming to safety. Andres was charged with terrorism for both attacks. According to his lawyer, Breivik admitted to carrying out both the bombing and the shooting during the interrogation, but claimed that his actions although atrocious, were necessary. At his arraignment on July 25th, Breivik was ordered to remain in custody for eight weeks, with the initial four weeks to be spent in solitary confinement. Breivik expressed a desire for an open hearing and to attend it wearing a uniform of his own creation, but the presiding judge denied both requests. After being apprehended, Breivik underwent evaluation by court-appointed forensic psychiatrists who diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia and concluded that he was psychotic at the time of the attacks, 
and legally insane. This diagnosis received criticism in newspaper discussions, but after an extensive review by a panel of experts, the submitted report was approved without any remarks by the Norwegian Board of Forensic Medicine. Breivik's defense attorney stated that, initially, Breivik was surprised and offended by the conclusions of the report. However, he later saw it as providing new opportunities. In response to the criticism of the initial psychiatric report, a second psychiatric examination was authorized by the court in January 2012. The subsequent report, issued in April 2012, declared Breivik to be mentally sound. Ultimately, the district court's five-judge panel reached a verdict and ruling concurring that Breivik was mentally competent. The trial took place in Oslo District Court, where Breivik faced charges for his role in the bombing and mass shooting. The trial began on April 16, 2012, and lasted for 10 weeks, attracting global attention due to the magnitude and brutality of the attacks. During the trial, Breivik admitted to carrying out the attacks but claimed that they were necessary and justified as part of his extremist ideology. The court proceedings provided an opportunity for survivors, victims' families, and the public to confront the horrifying details of the events. The trial featured emotional testimonies, expert witnesses, and extensive evidence to establish Breivik's culpability and shed light on the motives behind his actions. On August 24, 2012, the court reached its verdict, finding Anders Breivik guilty of terrorism and premeditated murder. The court subsequently handed down a sentence of 21 years of preventive detention, which can be extended indefinitely if Breivik is deemed a continued threat to society. This is the maximum sentence allowed by Norwegian law, and it is the only way to allow for life imprisonment. This unique sentencing framework in Norway reflects a focus on rehabilitation and public safety rather than retribution. The court also acknowledged the possibility of parole after a minimum term of 10 years depending on the assessment of Breivik's rehabilitation progress.